Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, he just said the title, so I don't even need to say that. Um, I am Michelle Lopez. I am with Finish. I'm a planner and GIS specialist. My name is Amir Nezarati, uh, project manager with our transportation department. Um, been there about seven years. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Corey Davis. I'm a civil designer here with Cary, and I've been there. I'm actually on my second stint with the town of Cary, so I've been back for about two years. So first, we're going to do a little bit about the overview of this annual project, talk a little bit about the design phase that includes the data collection, and then the internal data and dashboards that Cary ends up doing, and the public awareness. So first off, a little bit about Benish. Most people in North Carolina, this is a new name to them. Um, we are new in North Carolina. We started in about 2014 here, and our transportation group started in 2016, originally from Chicago, and we're a full-service planning and design firm. Also, some of our staff um, have been working on this annual street improvement project for over about seven years with some other previous firms, and in 2020, the Benish team started working with the town of Cary. All right, yeah, so uh, we wanted to provide a quick background of our street improvements program, which really is our street maintenance program, our large street maintenance program. So we, our main um, kind of operations are street repaving, we do patching, curb ramp upgrades, and um, like rejuvenating some preventative maintenance like rejuvenator. Uh, we kind of re-envisioned re this program in 2014. Uh, we started hiring um, third-party consultants to partner with us. And like Michelle said, I've been working with the current team, Vanessa and Withers, uh, since 2020. Uh, we have approximately 500 miles of streets that we maintain, and our goal is to repay or maintain about 5% or 20 miles each year, um, with our average budget being around $7 million. Uh, so that's construction, engineering, um, and inspections as well. So with all of this, the main point is that our long-range planning document, the, um, it's called Imagine Carry or the um, 2040 Community Plan, really highlights the importance of a, a well-maintained street network. Uh, so preserving the character and the um, aesthetics of our existing neighborhoods as they age. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so our program is really broken up into three phases. The first one being the pavement condition survey. Uh, this is where we have our streets rated. Uh, so there's things like cracking and rutting, um, and those things are documented via a custom, uh, like, JS tool um, that they built. Uh, so after phase one, we get the data. That's really the foundation of our next phase with this design. Um, this is where we have staff going out into the field, collecting information about what needs to be repaired, what needs to be replaced. And that's something uh, that Michelle is going to go into. And then finally, we have the construction phase where things are built, roads are maintained. But really, with that phase, we're using GIS to document um, when things are maintained, so when roads are repaved, when our curb ramps have been upgraded. And um, Corey's going to talk a lot about that. So. All right, so like Amir said, I'm going to go more into the design phase. This is the actual boots on the ground. It's the pavement repair survey. So... We're doing about 20 miles of roads every year. That usually is going to be about 40 miles walking. You have to put the car on one side and walk back and forth. So lots of walking. It usually takes a couple of weeks to complete this with two field staff, and it's very weather dependent. Um, you cannot be doing these ratings in the rain. We have to actually mark on the roads with the paint, and if it's raining, the paint doesn't stay. Um, the ratings, like we said, the ratings already occurred in the previous phase, so the purpose of this phase is to investigate, identify, and field locate those proposed repairs. Some of those items when we're talking about repairs, um, some of the items we're looking at besides just the pavement itself could be things like utilities, manholes, and water valves, catch basins, and many more layers like in this um, middle section over there that has all the layers list. We're collecting all of this in one application for every segment. The other thing we have to, well, number one, safety is a big concern. We're in the roadway doing this, but we also have to survey the surrounding area around the road segments um, for other things that are not on the physical pavement, like street signs, down street signs, um, are not a good thing because they are not safe. So we have to make sure we let them know, and that gets fixed either in the design phase or if it's something that's a priority safety concern, we let them know immediately and we can get someone out there. So why is this phase important? It's important so the project can go to bid and eventually be constructed, but 
really more importantly, to quantify the cost for this project so we can construct it. So when I started on this project in 2021, I agreed the first year to do it the original way on these fun paper maps. Um, they are very hard to read. They are accurate for what they needed, but it was just very, there left so much room for human error. As you can tell, it's very hard to read the handwriting. Seeing it on paper, not on the screen, also very hard to read and decipher. People change their mind in the field. So it just, it hurt my, pro, or I'm a GIS person. And when I came on, I was like, oh gosh, we're doing paper, really? You sure you want to do this the first way? But it was the best decision. So for the next year, we could have a better project. Um, I was new to the pavement world and did not understand the whole process or the project that had been going on forever. The other thing that was very challenging with this way was the organization of it. Um, tons and tons of paper, did not like the clutter on my desk. Um, and so after the first year of doing it that way, I knew I was gonna be able to transform this and print no more paper. That was my motto for the second year. So I changed it from the static mapping to the GIS app based data collection. So this is just a simple picture of the design on, or the application on the left. All of the, so I created the custom field map application that we'd use for the design phase. And this app allows for all the data that was recorded on that physical paper that I showed to be inputted into this app. So the app allows to choose the appropriate item instead of typing or interpreting something, tons of drop downs, some of check boxes, so there's no translation error. My main goal of this app was to streamline the whole process and just remove all the unnecessary steps. This is, like I said, an annual project, but it's also a large scale annual project, so we just want to continue. Um, the, we want to continue to find ways to make this process just more efficient over the years, and we have. We've had lots of different iterations of things things that have worked and not worked, and we're just gonna keep going with it. So this is just an example, the map books we're talking about, this is an example of the final product, and this is the blueprint for the construction plans for every segment that we're going over. Um, it has tons of different, the items on the bottom are all the different quantities. You have um, all the quantities, the numbers for mill and fill, so how much asphalt you're taking up and how much asphalt you're putting back. Um, sidewalks are included with this, all the different utilities on the roads, and just many different things. Oh, I went backwards. So I'm going to step back a little bit about the equipment we decided to use. So in the past, like you said, the project has been going on for a little bit. Um, there had been some people who had tried a handheld GPS, I want to say probably six or seven years ago, the little handheld GPS that had the tiny little screen on it, and the field staff, the pavement evaluators, did not like it. They tried, um, they just said it was too clunky. The GIS people in the office also did not enjoy it because the people were not inputting the data correctly. So they decided the easier way, since it does have to be done, or, and it needs to be accurate, the easier, easiest way for them was to go back to the paper maps. So I knew, Ease of the application was the biggest one and not the handheld GPS. So I went with the EOS Aero 100 unit and I paired it with the iPad. So as you can see in the photo on the left, this is just example. This is actually in, um, we recently did this in Gastonia as well. Um, but we actually mounted a three, we 3D printed a mount for the antenna on our shoulder instead of wearing one of the hats that has the pouches or the survey rods or the rods in our backpack. Just because the nature of this project, we're in and out of the car constantly. We need something light. We field tested all the other ones and the cord would get caught or we have other equipment we have to take out in the field too. So those options just did not work for us. And although the shoulder is not the most accurate place to put it, it's far more accurate than doing it digitize or doing it on the paper maps and digitizing it. So we're very happy with the outcomes of it. Um, the other thing, the timing of this project um, with the fiscal year for carry usually puts us doing uh, the, this phase, the boots on the ground phase in the late summer. And we all know how hot the summer can get, especially in the triangle area. And you think it's hot, and then you add, you're standing on asphalt and pavement all day, and it gets even hotter. So we got some inspiration um, from 
Chick-fil-A, um, their drive through workers in COVID really transformed the drive through game. And they're standing outside with the tablets all day. And we're like, if they can use these tablets all day and are not getting the heat warnings on the iPads and everything, we can figure out a way. So we found a similar product, the Sun Shield. I highly recommend, very easy. So thank you, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Um, so this is just a snippet since we have replicated this process um, outside of Cary as well. This is just a snippet of kind of the daily process since it is such an iterative thing and we have more staff than just myself. People that have never used GS before are also using it. So just kind of the equipment, the pre, post, and infield items. But one of the biggest hurdles with getting this transition, um, the people who had never done this before, who had been working on this project for years and had their tried and true method, um, how to get them on board with the application, the biggest question they had is how are we gonna QA, QC this um, without paper maps to back check? So what we ended up coming up with, number one, I created the application. So we can't submit unless we have certain things in there. That really helps it. But also every day after the field, um, when we're in Cary, we, we're, our office is in Cary, so we just go back to the office and we go through every segment we do every day to make sure we have all the data. Um, when we were in recently in Gastonia, we did it in the hotel. <laughs> um, we just go through, make sure, because you're seeing, I mean, we can walk. Some days you can get a mile, some days you can get three miles. It just depends. You're seeing so many different street segments, so you really need it while it's fresh on your mind. So another thing, while we're in the field walking the streets in these orange orange vest every day, orange or yellow vest every day for multiple weeks, you tend to get stopped by citizens. Um, and they like, they like to let you know what's happening in their area, especially in their neighborhood, you're outside the house. So one citizen this past year let us know that their street was in need of some desperate repairs. And many times people let us know, but it's more of a cosmetic issue um, or inconvenience. It's not an actual structural or pavement uh, distress that needs to be fixed right away. However, in this case, the citizen was absolutely right. It was something that would definitely need to be added to the list. So with the old paper maps, we have, we get the street list that we're talking about, the 20 miles of segments that we're doing. And the field per, or the GIS person prints out all the field maps. So if you're in the field and some citizen stops you and wants you to go check out that, you have no map for it. So with the application, you actually have all of the street segments in there. So instead of going back to the office, getting a new map printed, or what the pavement evaluators like to do is turn the map over that they're working on and draw stuff on it and you get to try to decipher it, um, they can just click a button and the street's added and they collect all the data. Another thing with that, that um, if that street was not already on the list, we have to let them know why it needs to be on the list. Um, so let Carrie know why it needs to be on the list and usually pictures um, really help. So for this part, um, with the old ways, they would write down, hey, between house number 123 and 234, there's a manhole that re requires attention. And now, instead of us going back to the office, finding the location and sending them all that, we have the point, lat long, and the pictures in one thing, and it gets sent over to the client right away. So we're really just trying to make it more efficient and stop duplicating all these steps that we don't need. So another thing that we worry about are the curb ramps and sidewalks as part of this project. And one of the important parts of this project is ADA compliance. So that's the American with Disabilities Act compliance. It is required to bring curb ramps into ADA compliance when resurfacing takes place. Therefore, if the ramp is not compliant, the engineers will have to make a recommendation on how to construct it so it can be compliant. Once it's built, um, we get the data. There's certain slope and cross slopes and different requirements that we have to hit to make sure it is required. And once that happens, we give the data back to Cary, and Cary updates its internal database, and that's a big part of their transition plan, their ADA transition plan. So after all that heavy lifting's done, we get to manipulate and, and use the data. Um, and so you can see here is an example of our internal dashboard that we use to kind of monitor curb ramps. Um, and and I'll, I'll mention that our curb ramp monitoring is actually twofold. So we get the data also from uh, our development process. So when new neighborhoods come online or new developments happen, there's a monitoring of those curb ramps as well. And so that gets input into this internal database alongside what we receive from our surveys. 
So this project is the way, the main way we actually address our curb ramps and support um, that ADA audit, ADA audit information. So um, on January 2020, we actually completed that inventory of curb ramps as a part of the first uh, ADA transition plan. Um, and later in July 2021, staff actually performed this first curb ramp audit, um, including curb ramp inventory updates and the maintenance procedures that you heard Michelle talk about. Um, so the curb ramp inventory actually includes the location data, as well as the determination of whether the curb ramps are in compliance. Um, in addition to that, we felt that it was also useful, I have the picture down here in the bottom right corner of our 311 arm, that's our information arm for addressing or communicating with the public and carry. Um, so we've also included in the pop-up, you may not be able to see it, but uh, there's a, a blue compliant text right there. So we've actually incorporated a street view um, option for you know 311 when they're accessing this tool internally they can go to the street view and kind of get some updated information um, and the advantage of that is that you know they can address some of these issues or respond to concerns without having to go directly to our project manager um, and sort of you know in that cycle there um, so as Carrie's transportation uh, system is improved um, the curb ramp inventory is always updated um, so since its inception uh, we've actually made a 10% increase in our compliance, and this will continue to happen every year. Uh, so just as we have a curb ramp dashboard, we do the same for our, our street improvements dashboard. Um, so creating this, we're able to now display our pavement condition survey ratings. Um, and this is for the past 10 years. It will continue um, to help increase access to data, not, for, uh, not just for us as project managers and designers, but also on the public side or multi-department, cross-departmental uh, access. So we get to have our utilities department support this. We got parks and recs. We have other capital projects that are going on, sort of communication increase, uh, more advanced and enhanced decision-making around our projects. We don't want to come through and resurface a road and find out that there's a sewer issue going on under that. So uh, communication is very important. Um, a couple other advantages of having this dashboard Right, it improves our decision making through showing where investments actually happening. Right, so we since you know, the inception of this dashboard, we've actually built a capital projects GIS layer where we can now overlay certain projects to ensure that we're actually being efficient and effective, and making sure that seven million dollars or you know some other totals are actually being useful. Um, it also helps us to validate addressing neighborhood concerns. We talked about three one one. Right, so there's a huge communication effort going on in that area right now. Um, it improves the project coordination, like I mentioned, with utilities. And then lastly, it's more efficient data. All right, we are able to use the same schema, all right, the same information for those fields and those, and changing those attributes around so it's sort of cyclical and seamless as we get the data that comes in from, uh, from our, our, our um, collaboration effort. So for this project it actually meant for us that stakeholders across multiple departments uh, could perform interactive query. They can use this database. We can go back and scan back in 15, back in 17. We can realize this data. Um, and we can see these important aspects and how things have changed over time to be able to address that. So we've gone from more static to more a more dynamic interface. So Easier in access to this internal data actually helps us respond to citizens. So I keep harping on that because our communication is very important, uh, being in a service uh, climate. Um, so the view on the left actually provides um, the results of our ratings from our 2022 uh, survey. And this is a snapshot of one of our neighborhoods, the Walnut Hills neighborhood. Um, so Walnut Hills was one of our eight neighborhoods that we actually got to resurface in the 2022 um, street improvements process. So as we migrated from construction uh, to actually getting into doing the project work, we felt compelled that we needed to, again, respond to citizens, be able to communicate. So what we were able to do this time, we have the data. The data is efficient. The data is put together. So we were able to use Arcade. Uh, create a, another web map and actually embed this map on our street improvements page. So now using that feature, we can actually monitor and put up useful information for our public to see for when construction is going to happen in their neighborhood, focusing on specific streets and be able to edit that on the fly as we go. Um, so this is a huge advantage for us, um, especially for Mir, uh, in terms of communicating for with citizens and, and also collaborating with our 311 effort. 
we used to we used to post this like giant uh, PDF on the website. No one could you couldn't search it, you couldn't do anything. So. So once the project is actually complete, uh, we actually can prepare for the next cycle. So you can see the view on the right, um, an update of our 2023 ratings. Uh, a lot of the streets are in green. Uh, we don't have a legend here. Hopefully the green to you means that everything's been resurfaced. Um, and so we can continue now this process cyclically. So this was actually our initial effort into going into using an interactive map, publishing this on our web page, and then responding to citizens in that manner. Um, so it proved to be very helpful, uh, especially when responding to citizens, like I said before. And we're all uh, actually gearing up for our next iteration of this cycle. So um, sort of closing this by mentioning some lessons learned. We've actually kind of gotten feedback on this process and displaying information for the public. So um, some information that we've gotten is, you know, making sure that the maps are searchable when we put the neighborhoods up the first time we only had them to be able to s click on a, partic a particular polygon and it provides the information well 311 will like a searchable box to type in an address or a location and go there so that's something we'll iterate on the next cycle um and the next cycle also we're, we're actually going in to a domain change we're changing from a dot org to a dot gov so throughout that process it wasn't able to get information on how many hits on the web page uh, you know, since we made that change, so in the next iteration, we'll be able to monitor that to that that as well. Right. So this ends our presentation. Um, wow. yes, one. Any questions? Okay, awesome. <laughs> okay, cool. That makes you happy, Good. doesn't it? <laughs> no complaints, right? <laughs> oh, um, well, yeah, they're definitely a big stakeholder in our, our community. Um, but we, we have a pretty, it, I guess it helps that the office in Raleigh is so close. We have a lot of good coordination and collaboration with them. So it's pretty clear. They're, we're both pretty clear on who's maintaining what uh, most of the time. Uh, we have uh, actually JS and our maps are, we have those public facing too. There A lot of residents don't understand that. So we have um, kind of some references online that folks can look up. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Yeah. Another question or? Okay. Yeah. I actually live on that map. Oh, really? I don't have a problem. My mother-in-law lives there, and she complained the whole time. So let me, I guess, so in the first phase that we were talking about, we are driving the 500 miles. So that is in the first phase to get this pavement conditions. We're doing a pavement condition survey. That's driving. So that is driving and we are getting all that data. The design phase, that's only 20 miles. Um, we have tried, there are, we've actually done it in my company with airports, some pavement condition surveys and stuff with drones and different things like that. There's just so much that like Google Fiber is a big thing in Cary that they can't pick up. There's lots of little things like that. So we're not, it's not we're only doing, so we get the 500 miles and then we narrow that down to a combination of um, the worst rated and then also neighborhood proximity. So we don't go and do a cul-de-sac and not the road that attaches to it. So we get that and then we do the 20 miles. So we could do the full 500, but there's, with the automated way, but we're still gonna have to go out there and walk it and get boots on the ground, unfortunately, just how it is. Yeah, for that first phase, we, we have 
looked into that. Um, it kind of seems like we're kind of right there on the, uh, like 500 is like just enough where you could do it driving the, the survey. Kind of seems like once you get higher, maybe closer to 600, 700 miles, then it, it makes it more cost effective to do that. Um, but yeah, we, we've been looking. There's def definitely a lot of technology yeah. out there for um, automated ratings. Yeah, and the driving rating, we have an app that does that calculates it too. So we're not sitting there thinking of everything or yeah, making like, rating. This on archival data, like previous data, that yeah. collected, and then, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, that's a lot of what core. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we 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 are able to manage that. So it's it's also part of our SD, our spatial data engine. And so once we migrate that to the online process, that's when we can really. Uh, ramp it up and, and make it useful for the public. Awesome. Multiple layers of validation. Yes. Yes, sir. One more question, anybody? Real quick. Back to yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering, what are the factors that are going into the condition for like categories like diameter or screen area, and like what is the weight of the importance of those factors? Because I think I saw like the diameter is very bad, like how oh. bad. Yeah, there, so there is a uh, method. It's the same method that DOT uses. Uh, it's it was developed by, by ITRI at NC State. Um, so th we're looking at things like cracking, um, uh, rutting, raveling, um, like just the amount of patches that are out there. Um, ride quality. Ride quality. Yeah, you you know. It yeah. Almost, yeah. <laughs> um, are we there are standards. Their standard, yes, yes. It's just this standard process. Yeah. Really, it's like. Another question is, what's next? Will it be once the twenty twenty three paving starts? Then it will yes. be up. Yes. In the context of that that twenty twenty three, we do have our our street center line data that's published in our maps online. Um, that's readily available. But in terms of the twenty twenty three data, so that's to be done. Uh, we are in the process of finalizing those streets now. So once that's done, we'll edit the map and make that information public. I think there's maps on the, is it maps.carrync.gov? .gov. Yeah. Yes. You can, there's the map with the DOT versus carry streets on there. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Let's see if we got it.